All right, happy Thursday afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk about the Antebellum South and Slave Society today. Now, it's really important to know that life as a slave is difficult to summarize because everybody's experience was different. The experience of slaves that depended on who the owner was, how the owner treated them, uh, the types of work that the slave is going to perform, what type of agriculture, if they're going to live in the city, if they're going to live in the country, if they're going to live somewhere in between, if they live in the upper south, meaning in Virginia, Maryland, something like that, if they're going to live in the lower south, like Mississippi or Alabama, the experiences are very different. And it's also going to matter whether there are slaves nearby so that there's camaraderie and fellowship or if they live by themselves. What I'm really trying to say is slavery is very complex. Slavery is very complicated. So you can't just say this is what life was like as a slave. So I'm going to try to generalize it and, and um, just give you a good idea of what an average experience would be. Food, very basic. Uh, the average slave is going to get just the bare necessities. It's going to be a little bit of pork, cornmeal, coffee, uh, molasses or corn syrup for sweetener. Most slaves are going to be allowed to have some sort of vegetable garden where they can grow their own food. And a few very, very lucky slaves are trusted enough to hunt for additional meat, but that's very, very few. Clothing, once again, bare minimum. Uh, we're talking a couple of cotton shirts a year. If you're a woman, you get a couple of dresses. If those shirts or dresses wear out, you don't get new ones. You have to mend and fix what's broken. So you end up with clothes with patches in them and holes in them. Men are issued a couple of burlap sack canvas pants. If you've ever felt those really rough burlap potato sacks, just imagine having to wear those for your pants or in for your underwear. Once again, a couple of pairs of those. And if there's a hole that develops in them, you have to somehow patch them. If you are a field worker, you're probably going to be given a straw hat to protect you from the sun. And you don't get shoes unless the weather gets cold because shoes are expensive. And when they give you shoes, they're not going to be nice shoes. They're going to be shoes that are too big, too small, um, have holes in them. There's no telling. Housing. Uh, one room cabins that are usually about 10 feet by 20 feet. Uh, that's the size of like a living room or a bedroom today. If anybody has ever been to the Atlanta History Center, uh, which I know probably not many of you have, there's a slave cabin there that you can go and tour. Uh, they're going to have a wooden door, maybe two wooden doors, a front and a back. There's going to be a couple of windows. There's no glass, though. They use wooden shutters. Uh, the floor is going to be dirt. There's going to be mud caked on the walls to cover up holes and try to stop the wind com from coming through. Uh, there's going to be a fireplace and a really crude chimney just so that they can get some heat and they can cook. Furniture is handmade. The cooking utensils are usually handmade. The beds are going to be made out of straw. And this 10 foot by 20 foot bedroom basically is going to be shared by two families. There's also a lot of disease. Uh, now think about it. the poor diet means that their immune systems aren't very strong no shoes so who knows what they're stepping in and stepping on infections in your feet and everything crowded housing means that diseases are going to spread very quickly the infections are going to be very severe uh, they did not know anything about social distancing Work patterns in agriculture, but before I do work patterns in agriculture, your secret word of the day is cat, C-A-T. Now, why cat? It's because I have a lazy cat sleeping right in front of me. So I'm going to make that the word of the day, cat, C-A-T. Now, work patterns in agriculture. Uh, there are two different types of labor that agricultural slaves would be doing. One is called gang labor, and the other one is called task labor. In gang labor, everybody works together. Uh, this is what you typically think of when you think of slave work. 
men and women are both working in the field. They're out there working together, but they're doing different jobs. The men might be picking the cotton, the women might be tearing out weeds, or the, the women might be hoeing the grass while the men are uh, putting down pest repellent, things like that. And gang labor is going to be seen most often where cotton and tobacco are grown. The big field jobs, that's cotton, tobacco, that's gang labor. Task labor, you're going to find that a lot where rice and sugar is grown, things where you have to do individual tasks or separate tasks at the same time. So individuals are given a task, individuals are told to complete that task, men and women are working separately doing separate things. So there's gang labor where everybody's together doing one thing. Might be different jobs, but they're all working together. Task labor, individuals, different tasks working separately. Now, agricultural hours, uh, they vary a little bit, but generally speaking, they're long, sun up to sun down. Um, the amount of work you're doing varies from season to season. The exact hours kind of vary from season to season. Traditionally, though, spring and summer are going to be the longest and the hardest because that's when the crops are growing. And towards the end of summer, of course, that's when the crops are harvested. Breaks are usually given during the hottest hours of the day, but not always because, once again, it depends on the way the slave was treated and who the owner was. Uh, after the harvest, fall and winter are going to be spent preparing for the next growing season. So it could be getting the seeds ready. It could be repairing machinery or repairing tools, whatever that might be. But generally speaking, sun up to sundown year round. If you're a slave and you're working as a servant or an artisan, somebody who makes stuff, your experience is going to be a little bit different. Uh, these are usually going to be maids, personal servants, blacksmiths, carpenters, somebody who's going to work closer to the family. Uh, this is both good and bad. It's good because the, the house slaves, the artisans, typically escape the harsh field labor. They have it, I hate to say a little easier, but they don't have it, they have a different type of heart, I'll put it that way. But it's also bad because they're in closer proximity to the owners. Their behavior is much more closely observed. They can get in trouble for the smallest thing. And then there's also the additional hazard of unwanted sexual advances. Generally speaking, not always, but generally, uh, the house slaves are going to be better off than field slaves, but not always. Then you even have some slaves that are going to work in cities and work in industries. These could be household slaves in the city, could be tinsmiths, coppersmiths, silversmiths, carpentry, uh, shipbuilders sometimes, industry workers. They typically have the greatest freedom of movement. Like in the city of Charleston or in Savannah, a slave would go do the shopping instead of the woman of the house. Some slaves are given work in factories, in mines. They can cut down lumber or work in lumber yards, but they don't get any money for their services. All that money goes to their owner. And the more skilled you are, the more value you have. There's evidence of slaves in Charleston having value of up to $25,000, and that is like 1800s money, which is a couple million today. So I don't know how they managed to put a value on a person's life. I guess it's because they looked at them as property and not people, but there were some slaves that had values that today would be millions of dollars. Now, controlling slaves. The physical condition of slaves is very comparable to the physical conditions of yeoman farmers, remember those are independent farmers, and poor whites. The physical condition is pretty similar to poor white people, but the physical control is much different. Yeoman farmers, poor whites, independent, free, they can do whatever they want. Slaves, even though their physical condition is the same, they are subject to physical control. Uh, slaves are whipped, slaves are caged, slaves are branded, they're denied food. Their well-being is controlled by others. There's a famous Supreme Court case from the Supreme Court of North Carolina. And it's called North Carolina versus Man, and it's in 1830. 
the North Carolina Supreme Court rules that slave owners have absolute authority over their slaves. And no matter what a slave owner did to their slave, they could not be found guilty of violence. So a slave owner could slap a slave, break a slave's leg, even kill a slave. And that person could not be found guilty of violence because a slave was considered property. A very famous quote from this court case, the North Carolina Chief Justice Thomas Ruffin, he goes on to say, the power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. So that gives you an idea of how much and what types of physical control that Southern slaves could be put to. Now, as bad as the physical aspect was, that's really not the worst part. It's the mental aspect that is the worst part. Uh, just think about it. You have no freedom. You have no concept of freedom. Um, you can always think and ponder and dream. There is complete control over your movements. There are slave patrols watching over you. You never know where they're going to be. They're always searching for runaway slaves, missing slaves. You could have papers giving you permission to go to town and they could still stop you, search you, and accuse you of being a runaway slave. You're forced to submit to every demand of your master. Anything your master says, you must do. And there's all that uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen about your future. You don't know if your family's going to stay together. You don't know if you're going to be safe, if you're going to live, if you're going to die, if you're going to get food. As bad as a physical aspect was, in many ways, the mental aspect is even worse. Some masters were viewed as good because they treated slaves as valuable property. And then there were some masters who were viewed as bad because they treated slaves as replaceable property. But notice, no matter whether they were considered good or bad, the operative word there is property. Slaves weren't seen as people. There is a lot of resistance that happens. Uh, for example, um, there's some individual resistance. One individual resistance that I didn't put into the PowerPoint, but I'm going to tell you through this lecture, is a persistence of African culture. The slaves tried to hold on to their, their way of life, their history, their religion, their family roles, their gender roles. They try to hang on to the way things were. They may be a couple generations away from Africa, but stories are still passed down of what life used to be. And there's this attempt to hold on to the traditional African culture. There's also work slowdowns, refusals to obey orders, sabotage of work equipment. Some people would purposely break their tools. Slaves would run away, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently. And then there's theft, arson, murder. All of those were forms of individual resistance. But there's also organized resistance too. Uh, Gabriel Prosser, August 30th, 1800. Uh, this is in Virginia. There was a slave revolt on the island of Haiti and word of this slave revolt gets out and it gives some of these slaves here in the South an idea that they can uprise too. Gabriel Prosser, he's a blacksmith. Uh, he's got a modest amount of freedom because he is a skilled slave, so he's able to move around on his own. And he and his brother plot a plan to lead slaves into Richmond, Virginia, burn down the city, and then start a larger uprising, not upper, uh, a rebellion, if you will. Well, Prosser manages to gain support of about 50 or 60 slaves. Uh, estimates are that as many as a thousand other slaves knew about it, but weren't going to uh, participate. The plan leaks out. Gabriel Prosser has to put his plan into action too early. Uh, the plans to burn Richmond fail because it's raining and it's wet and it's hard to burn things when the rain's going on. Um, the leaders of Gabriel Prosser's rebellion are rounded up. Prosser and his brother are executed, and then other people are executed as well for knowing about it or participating in it, and then even more slaves are sold to the Deep South, to, to Alabama and Mississippi, where they're treated very harshly. There's also Denmark Vesey. 
Uh, Denmark Vesey, he was a free black. He won his freedom in a lottery in the 18 teens. And he still lived in Charleston, South Carolina, even after getting his freedom. He's still associated with some of his old slave friends. And he planned a rebellion in Charleston that was supposed to happen in 1822. Um, it's estimated that as many as 3,000 slaves knew that this was going to happen and were willing to participate. But his plan got leaked. He and some other leaders were rounded up and executed and his rebellion was put down very harshly. And then probably the best known rebellion before the Civil War is Nat Turner's Rebellion. And that was from August 21st to August 23rd, 1831. I was in a place called Southampton County, Virginia. It is Southern Virginia, right along the North Carolina border. Uh, Nat Turner, he is somewhat educated as a kid, he becomes a preacher. Uh, he's able to have freedom of movement because he is a preacher. And he plans for a long time on how to revolt. He really thinks this out. He is much more educated than the average slave. He knows how to read. He knows how to write. He gets a group of about 100 slaves to rebel. Uh, they kill about 60 people uh, before they are caught. Uh, the slave rebellion is put down two days after it starts. Uh, 200 blacks are executed, including many who knew of the rebellion but didn't actively participate. And this Nat Turner's rebellion is what slave owners are going to think of when they think of slave rebellions. And because Nat Turner was somewhat educated, he did know how to read, he did know how to write, education for slaves is almost completely stopped until after slaves gain their freedom. Now there are other slave rebellions out there, but these I think are probably the biggest three that you need to know. Right, so that is it for today. Uh, make sure that you check the course calendar, get all the work you are supposed to do done for this week. Also make sure that you get the secret word quiz done. Remember there's a secret word for last video lecture and then the secret word for this video lecture as well. All right, we'll talk to you soon. I hope you have a good weekend. Bye-bye.